Hello and welcome to the Waking Youth Podcast, a show dedicated to reminding us to not sleepwalk through our waking state. Today I'm conversing with Jorge Ferrer. Jorge is the author of several books, including Love and Freedom, Transcending Monogamy and Polyamory, and Novogamia, Más Allá de la Monogamia y del Poliamor. Jorge is also a former professor at the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology and the California Institute of Integral Studies, where he completed his doctoral research and served as the chair of the Department of East-West Psychology. In a reality where monogamy tends to be the in-question default mode, I was drawn to Jorge's work for his fresh perspectives on the theme of romantic relationships. Together we explore his research, aimed at transcending the binary monogamy-polyamory, culminating in Jorge's coining of the term novogamy, as well as the motivations that led him to such explorations. I would say that my first waking up moment was when I was walking in Barcelona with my first steady girlfriend. And I was walking in Paseo de Gracia with her, it's very clear. And I was very much in love with her and she loved me very much. It was a beautiful relationship. And then I had like this flash, like almost like a download coming into me, like saying, wow, our culture is telling me that the fact that I love this woman so deeply and I'm in this beautiful relationship, it means that I can express or receive embodied, even sensuous or sexual love from any other of the 7.8 billion people in the planet. And that, that kind of a woke up moment is like, what's going on? What's going on that we, we limit ourselves in that way, you know? Uh, and that was the beginning of many decades of exploration. I'm Carlota Getsch, and this is The Waking Youth Podcast. Welcome, Jorge, to the Waking Youth Podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Carlota. It's a pleasure to be here, absolutely. I would like to start, um, as I usually do, grounding things in a little bit of personal history. And I would like to do this in a different way today. As I was investigating your work, and I started with your work around romantic relationships, relational freedom... Later on, I got to the more spiritual side of things with the participation in the mystery and running the risk perhaps of oversimplifying or recognizing patterns in a simplified way. Some words that resonated with me and that were transversal to all of these different books were integrity or perhaps integration freedom, pluralism, and co-creation. And I selected these words, and I'm curious about what they mean to you in the context of your personal history. <laughs> wow, it's a big question. Uh, I would say, like, uh, for me, I will start from the last one, co-creation, that's also participation. Uh, for me, co-creation means many things, but uh, it means uh, in particular that... Uh, that we can live uh, a life that is co-created by all of who we are. Uh, in our modern times, uh, we have been like uh, being educated mostly in our minds, uh, a very cognizant education. Uh, so, um, you know, the kindergarten was like a very integral school. You know, we play, we dance, uh, we, we learn um, to write, but uh, it was like really, really integral in so many ways. But as we move to high school and then to uh, university levels, all the education gets focused on the mind. Mm -hmm. So the outcome of this is that we, we become adults uh, in a more rational mental perspective, but not in a physical, emotional, and uh, vital perspective, sexual perspective. So co-creation for me is like, it's like an invitation to, to really live a life that is not just ruled by the mind, but it's kind of like uh, co-created by all of who we are, all these dimensions, as, as a team, you know, as equal yeah. partners in the unfolding of our lives and our spiritual lives. And uh, I'll just mention about pluralism because it's connected to, uh, to also our conversation, and uh, I'll leave it here at the moment. Um, pluralist for me is like a, it's a celebration of diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it's not only pluralist, it's like critical pluralism. Uh, so so yes, let's celebrate this diversity, but that doesn't mean that we cannot uh, understand certain options better or worse for ourselves 
or perhaps for the larger society. So one thing is to celebrate diversity. That is very, uh, of course, politically correct too. But there is like a, for me, there is like a, there is like a deeper source of um, pluralism that is like the, the, the unfolding creativity of the spirit uh, through us that's kind of mm-hmm. participating in the spirit. So um, both um, religious options, uh, normally there is, you know, all the religions, they think they have the greatest truth or the ultimate truth, and they tend to look down to other options, but also in the relational styles. Exactly. You know, relational styles, like uh, monogamous people look down at polyamorous people, polyamorous people look down as, as monogamous people. And uh, part of my work is to, is to say, listen, uh, this is kind of silly. Uh, um, uh, we need to move beyond this kind of like dualistic thinking and understand that uh, these different options Options, both spiritual and also relational, can work better or worse for different people, different dispositions, different contexts, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Great. As I research a bit about your work and a bit about your background, I understood, and you talk a lot about this, that when you first moved to California, that's, that was a moment of, of a lot of experimentation, particularly in this context of alternatives in terms of romantic relationships. And as you know, the theme and the, the, the angle of this podcast is to explore these little moments of waking up from a previous state of sleepwalking. And we also mentioned a little bit the context you were growing up in Spain. So I'm curious to explore a bit of these moments of waking up for you in the context of romantic relationships. Sure, that's that's beautiful. Uh... Well, I would say that my first waking up moment was when I was walking in Barcelona with my first steady girlfriend. And I was walking in Paseo de Gracia with her, it's very clear. And I was very much in love with her and she loved me very much. It was a beautiful relationship. And then I had like this flash, like almost like a download coming into me, like saying, wow, our culture is telling me that the fact that I love this woman so deeply and I'm in this beautiful relationship, it means that I can express or receive embodied even sensuous or sexual love from any other of the 7.8 billion people in the planet. Mm-hmm. And that, that kind of a woke up moment is like, what's going on? What's going on that we, we limit ourselves in that way, you know? Uh, and that was the beginning of many decades of exploration. Of course, when I <coughs> shared those um, concerns or that with my friends and the family, almost everybody told me like, uh, what's wrong with you? Like, uh, there's something wrong. I call that like polyphobia later. Yes. That kind of like sense that like, if you deviate from mononormativity, like from like um, the default monogamous kind of like set up, then suddenly you are pathologized or stigmatized in some ways. And uh, and then I went into psychotherapy. I was like, well, what, what's going on with me? And only many years later when I moved to California, of course, uh, and also before even, I met a couple that uh, they were living this kind of like uh, open relationship and I engaged in a relationship with them that I uh, was highly spiritual. They were very evolved, uh, emotional, intelligent, uh, spiritually awake. And uh, so for me, the entry into polyamory was, uh, was, was very different, was like a uh, very special. Um, and, uh, and then I went to California and then I learned about the term polyamory and yes. so many people were experimenting this. And then <clears throat> in my most poly phases and later, maybe we can talk later about this, I also have phases that were more monogamous and even mm-hmm. celibate. But in most more poly phases, like when I look back, I realize, well, I think I was asking the wrong question. Like the question is not why I want to love more than one person. The question is why not? Yeah. Why don't I want to love more than one person and, and why the culture prevent us to do so with these cultural mandates? Mm-hmm. And, and what do you think? Like, I think it's interesting, you know, because when we are younger, sometimes we don't have even the language to talk about certain things. So I'm curious about what already back then do you think was that impulse towards exploring polyamory and later on other alternatives? Yes. Well, um, basically, uh, when I had this kind of uh, relationship with this couple, I didn't even have the term polyamory, but it was yeah. like a really beautiful connection. Uh, it went for three years. Uh, it ended when I became celibate. Uh, it didn't end in about where there are some of my best friends. One of them passed away uh, last year. Uh, but uh, um, but it was like um, it was like something that it felt like uh, it was very magic. Uh, it was like... Uh, 
this woman and there were two men who were her primary partners. So in a way, also I entered in a in a different way because there is many men today that were going to polyamory because they want you know to have many women, you know, and mm-hmm. that's kind of a, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's experience or desire from the right place. But also I feel today in the panorama in polyamory, both in the Bay Area of California, in Spain and other places, that there is a lot of distortions. Yeah. That people people use the the rhetoric of polyamory and even the spiritual rhetoric of polyamory to basically do what the men have been doing all always around, like uh, fuck around as many as many women as possible, you yeah. know. Sometimes even controlling them, uh, even if they say that they are polyamorous. And they don't understand that the the greatest the, the greatest um, um, value, spiritual value of polyamory or open relationships is not about being with many people. It's about like really supporting and even celebrating that uh, the people you love also mm-hmm enjoy and celebrate with other people and that's always like a, a cutting edge uh, in a lot of the polyamorous uh, adventures that people uh, do today mm-hmm. okay and where does novogamy come in well novogamy came uh, out of my personal experience um even you know those two books i just published um they are based in an article I published like more than 10, 12 years ago in California mm-hmm. uh, in a couple of several magazines, even Buddhist magazines and uh, spiritual oriented magazines like the Kroon. Uh, and um, that came from um, after that kind of like 10 years, 10 year period of explorations in California, like being polyamorous and uh and exploring all that um, with great or less success, you know, like uh, you know, when we when we go into uh, uncharted territories, we need to give ourselves a lot of slack yeah. and a lot of compassion because it's uncharted territory so we're going to make mistakes and that's how we learn to try and an error so but those 10 years i would say overall they were very successful they opened up beautifully and uh had really beautiful uh, open relationships with different people and then after some point um, i realized like uh, when i also entered a period of celibacy for three years and um like a calling of my energies to go inward and I didn't know when it would end it. It wasn't like a mental bow, like yeah. I wanted to become celibate to become a spiritual enlightened. My energies went inside and they reawakened in a different way after two, two years and eight months, more or less. And after that time, I realized, you know, um, I've been living this poly life uh, for most of my young adulthood. And it's like, what's, what's, what's that in monogamy for me? So I was very curious. So for the next 10 years, uh, the three most important relationships I had, uh, about three years each, and they were strictly monogamous. Um, and then at some point during this exploration, I realized, you know, I don't feel either poly or mono. Mm-hmm. I feel I have the freedom to uh, live uh, both types of relationships without serious fears or conflicts. And therefore, I already feel, felt like that was kind of like beyond the binary. Uh, yeah. and, um, and then I started exploring in this article in the books, what's the territory that uh, lie, that exists beyond that monogamy, polyamory, dichotomy, in the same way that the transgender movement did with gender. This is something that I tell in my talks because for people, it helps them to understand. Ten years ago, you were male or female, right? There was no other option. And then the transgender movement and transgender scholars and practitioners, they had taught us, like, through their experience that there is a tremendous territory in between and, uh, and beyond and, uh, uh, like, integrating values for male and female. So that's part of what I'm doing with this term, Novogamy, like uh, mapping the territory that, uh, that exists beyond that binary. Mm-hmm. I have to say that as I was preparing for this episode and I ran into your work a few months ago, I've been talking to people about novogamy and the fact that the word implies this idea of new, it brings a lightness that really helps the conversation. Because if I say polyamorous, that I'm exploring polyamory, even intellectually, there's a bit of a resistance. But to novogamy, because you know, particularly the younger generations who are questioning a lot of things in this meta postmodernist phase that we are, they're open to exploration, but there's still a lot of the heritage of the traditional and serial monogamy. So they think it's wrong, ethically that is wrong. And novogamy also, it's not only the new, it invites the co-creation that with each partner, with each lover that you have, you both create something that 
makes sense for you. And I appreciate that newness a lot. <laughs> exactly. And I want to make two comments around the term that, uh, as you know from, from the books, like uh, I'm not attached to any new term. Uh, yeah. Even Novogamy like, includes uh, the option that people may want to do all these kinds of explorations without identifying themselves with as being Novogamous, you know. Because for some people, any new term can become a new canon, a new ideology, a new trap, conceptual trap, and they prefer not to do so. And I very much encourage that, you know. Mm-hmm. But for other people to find a term, it kind of helps them like to say, oh, wow, uh, this is what I'm experimenting, and now I have a term, I can speak about it, and I can't respond to that kind of um, oppressive question that most people experience today as increasingly oppressive. Are you monogamous or polyamorous? Yeah. Well, uh, um, for a long time, I couldn't say, well, I'm neither of them. Uh, it depends on my moment. Uh, it depends on who I meet. It depends on my developmental state. It depends on many, many factors. So um, the term novogamy, hopefully, my hope is that it helps people in that regard. Mm-hmm. But the other caveat is that, um, you know, all terms have problems, you know. And novogamy, in a way, kind of like, a, it creates like a, kind of like a, Another binary with old, you know, new old. Mm. You know? And, uh, and that's a caveat that I'm very aware of, very mindful of. And of course, that's not the intention. Uh, um, I, I get out of my way, as you know, to make the case very strongly that uh, in the same way that being transgender, it's not better or worse than being male or female. In the same way that being transracial, it's not better or worse than uh, that being like uh, Asian or African-American. Yeah. To identify as Navogamos is not better or worse. It's not a new hierarchy. It's, this mm-hmm. is very important. The whole point, what we're aiming here for, is about relational freedom. Uh, the freedom to co-create the romantic, sensual, intimate life that each person wants. And that can change over time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I guess that's the limitation of language. That's the beauty, that we're able to pave new ways or allow people to feel more at home through these terms, but at the same time, we keep evolving it, so we'll always find the blind spots of the terms, no? Exactly. Every term can be deconstructed, can be critiqued, it's it's the conceptual map. Uh, But if it helps for some people, fantastic, and I encourage people, maybe you can create your new term that works for you, but allows you to answer that oppressive question that uh, if you don't feel identified with monogamous or polyamorous, Uh that's important. Okay. Before we jump into the questions of the audience, I have two curiosities that I would very much like to explore with you. Which one to start with is the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in your hands. Mm-hmm. Often in, in Love and Freedom and the, the Spanish version with the new editions as well, Novogamia, you mention the the or you invite people to reflect about the possibility of instead of being committed to people we are committed to something greater mm-hmm. you know i am very curious to explore what that means to you and how do you think perhaps that could transform even how we navigate romantic relationships or relationships in general yes yes that's great Great question. Thank you. Well, there is, uh, of course, I'm totally into, uh, you know, uh, being committed to people, you know. Sometimes one of the criticisms of non-monogamy is that, uh, oh, these people are lack lack commitment. If they Mm -hmm. have real commitment, they would be really committed to one person. Well, um, it could be said also the other way around that many people who are with different partners, they are actually committed to more people, you know, the commitment could be greater. It's a different kind of commitment, so to speak. So I'm very supportive of, like, uh, being committed. Uh, but at the same time, I feel that uh, when we just commit to to people, you know, and that's there's a beautiful, romantic, and sacred dimension to that, mm-hmm. but uh, we lose sight um, of a larger context of kind of um, spiritual awakening, of uh, spiritual growth, um, so um, I would say, like, well, yes, let's commit to people, but even deeper than that, we, we commit to, to the, the blooming of love in all its manifestations on the planet Earth. There is so much war today, yeah. so painful, so much work, there is so much violence, there is so much uh, shit going around, especially in romantic relationships, there is so much domestic violence, 
there's so much control, there's so much jealousy that is like really sometimes leads into violence. So uh, let's commit to, to love uh, in a deeper way, you know, that c- could relax those tensions. Or even commit to um, uh, your own spiritual development and also the spiritual development of all the people you are in connected with, either if it's one or many, you know. So uh, commitment to life, commitment to love, commitment to spiritual awakening, underneath the commitment to singular people, I think it's like a good tandem, good tandem yeah. for, for, a, for a more healthier, more harmonious, less codependent, uh, more um, creative, uh, intimate relationships. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I personally find that very helpful because sometimes my experiences with conventional monogamy in the sense that it's default it's not actively chosen is that very easily you know we when we start thinking about even terms like jealousy it invites very much for this competition it's us the couple against everyone else that tries to get inside our house you know but this new vision it's um, it's it frees me to explore what that commitment to life and love and human flourishing, you know, could mean in relationship with different people, you know, and it's almost as if I'm discovering how to love each person that I interact with in different ways. You know? Exactly. That's for me one of the key things is like uh, each person is going to awaken different parts of yourself. If you or the, your audience like uh, reflect and uh, see what each of the people that they were romantically involved in their past, Awakening them, they could realize perhaps that could have been almost different persons sexually or emotionally or socially with different people. So that's part of like what uh, makes like uh, intimate relationships like a part of like, spiritual growth mm-hmm. and integral growth because um, you, you become aware of more parts of who you are and, uh, and also you can start embracing those parts of who you are and uh, become more holistic, become more, more fully who you are. Um, the other thing that uh, you mentioned, because you mentioned about the default uh, monogamy, uh, something that is also important for me to clarify, uh, mm-hmm. um, I already said this, but uh, I'm not against monogamy per se, but uh, I'm against socially enforced monogamy. And monogamy is enforced through a variety of legal, institutional, cultural mechanisms Hollywood movies, uh, pop music lyrics, they all go around monogamy, you know, it's search, it's failure and so forth, you know, and, uh, and it's very, it's very tragic. Like, uh, I'll just give you one example that was very poignant for me. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the beautiful writing books is that you get letters from people that you don't know at all. And uh, some of them like touch your heart. This one touched my heart very deeply. Uh, it was from a representant or the director, I think, of this organization in the United States. But it's a worldwide organization called Husbands Out to Wives. And it's thousands of members of uh, married men with families that uh, at some point during their, during their marriage, they realized that they were gay. They were wow. gay. And mm-hmm. they don't want to leave their wives. They don't want to leave their family life. And they told me, like, man, reading your book, it really opens up for us. Uh, like a language, uh, like a map that we can really uh, engage like our partners and we, uh, we're going to talk about this. The, uh, I will probably be in a talk for them at some point. And uh, so these kind of uh, messages when this kind of like marginal populations, I didn't even know that that organization existed. Yeah. Thousands of members of men, mm-hmm. I felt so much for them, beautiful families, and then have either to frustrate themselves uh, or, or cheat and... So the point, well, there is other ways to do this. And uh, hopefully those books and uh, these kind of programs we do will open open up for this kind of more healthier conversations. Yeah, it's intriguing that you mentioned this because right now I'm watching the show Grace and Frankie. I don't know if you know this show. No, I don't. Uh, so, I... so it's two different couples that they're friends, heterosexual couples. They're friends for a lot of years. And then the two men come out to their two wives that they have been together for the last 20 years in a gay relationship. And then it's the story of how these two women deal with this, but also the two men, you know. And at the same time, the four of them are very close. They have kids. They have a shared home, holiday house that they go often. So what happens is that the two men 
go to one of the houses of one of the couples, the, the ex couples, and the other, the two women go to the beach house. <laughs> And it's fascinating because, you know, it, it's very silly, you know, it's a comedy, but it's so, I think it's so refreshing to see how they're able to mm. transcend that situation and they are able to love each other, mm-hmm. you know, for who they are as human beings, not because of all of these default modes of how marriages should work, you know, things did not work out. So we break up, we break our bonds. No, they try to work on their relationship and then it goes to the point that even when, for example, like the two men are fighting, the two women are helping them, you know, <laughs> uh, heal the, the relationship. Yeah, beautiful. I, I'll, I'll have to watch it. Uh, but I'm I'm aware of a number of TV shows and movies that are in the last five ten years that have been emerging that uh, they touch these themes, you know. And uh, I think it's like a sign that. Uh, Collectively, the collective consciousness is kind of like really yeah. a waking up, waking up also to all these possibilities and I start exploring them in social media and also like in, in yeah, impacting TV programs and so forth. So it's, mm-hmm. I think it's good news. Yes. The other thing that I was curious about, in the book Novogamia, you even have an image that illustrates this and you're talking about what qualifies a romantic relationship as successful or not, and you challenge a bit the that this judgment only on the basis of the longevity of the relationship. And in that context, you talk about the ecological, soci- social, political, transformative aspect of the relationship as well. And you know, if you're in, involved in spiritual communities and the spiritual jargon, this makes sense. But if you're not, this might be surprising. And I thought this was quite refreshing. So I'm curious about what this also means to you. How did you come up to to this definition of or this this term to then judge the success of a relationship? Yes, thank you. Well, it also comes through all my personal explorations. Uh, actually, I have to confess that when I fell uh, when I first felt drawn to uh, to exploring these alternative non-monogamous relationships, I had like a um, kind of like a half a conscious, half unconscious motivation to to really explore relationships that would last longer. Because I would see like a serial monogamy is the paradigm today. To so many of my friends changing partners every a few years, few months, few weeks, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, and many of them like getting increasingly frustrated by that and uh, and so forth, you know, and. Um, but then uh, at some point of that exploration, I start realizing like, um, this is kind of silly <laughs> because like, um, you know, if we, if, if you and I, we go for dinner one day and we have this splendid dinner, right? And we, uh, then when the dinner is over, we don't say, well, the dinner was super bad because it's over. Yeah. Or we say this great performance, a great, great movie, and we really enjoy it. And it also gives us a lot, you know, it's inspiration and uh, things like that. Then the movie is over, the performance is over. No one would say, well, that was like a very shitty performance because it was over, you know? Why do we do this with our intimate relationships, you know? So the, the new criteria I'm bringing forward as, as an invitation to explore is two, two different types. One is like the transformative power of this, uh, the healing power, you know? How, how much this relationship like um, is healing me, some blocking sexual blocks, uh, it's, it's, opening me, it's opening my heart, you know? It's making me more spiritually aware, you know, mm-hmm. even more uh, eco sociopolitically aware, you know. What's what's are the the outcomes of this relationship, you know? So I think this kind of more transformative criteria, healing criteria, uh, I think are much better uh, and much more constructive by standards to evaluate if our relationship was successful or not, independently of how it, how long it lasted. I can imagine, like, uh, an experience, I speak from experience, um, that maybe a relationship that was pretty short in time, perhaps I had, like, this amazing mystical erotic encounter that opened myself spiritually in a way that I had never dreamed before. Mm-hmm. And maybe it was an encounter I had, like, uh, traveling in, uh, in Asia, and it was less for a few weeks because then I was coming back and that was it. And why is this less successful than a relationship yeah. that lasts for 10 years 
uh, that people are like doing, you know, like it's not so transformative for the people. People are doing passive aggression, codependent. But in our culture, it's like when I was like talking about some people about like when I was in the more poly phase, mm-hmm. uh, the first question they would ask me is like, oh, how long it lasted? You know, yeah. it's like, well, um, I don't know, like two, three years or two, one year. And then immediately, like, you see, uh, it doesn't work, you know. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> in mon- because we live in a mononormative culture, uh, when it's monogamous relationships, uh, it's a different answer. It's like, well, the thing is like, well, you need to work on yourself or maybe you didn't find the right partner, you didn't find your soul mate, but no one challenges the structure of monogamy per se. So um, that's why I brought this criteria. And the idea is like... Uh, you know, love love transforms, you know, it never ends. For me, I, I don't see relationships finishing. Mm-hmm. I see them transforming. Love changes in a different way. And uh, I think that's much more constructive versus like, it's over, like, I don't want to talk with you. And of course, for some people, especially if the decision was not mutual, there could be a time of separations, you know, to lick your wounds <laughs> and uh, and to before you reconnect as a friend. Mm-hmm. But as we become more emotional and intelligent, you know, I think this will be it's already happening you now that um, most people, you know, they maintain friendships with ex partners, you know, but not long ago it was much, much harder. Yeah. Beautiful. I think now it's the is the time to jump to some of the questions. Of sure. the audience thinking of a romantic relationship between two people let's say that one of the the persons in the relationship has this or has a different vision than the other yes. and wants to explore perhaps something like novogamy or polyamory or monogamy and the other does not what would be some of your thoughts uh on this yes. situation? Sure. It's very common. Uh, I'm a couple of therapists as well, and uh, this is one of the main reasons many couples come to see me. One of them wants to explore open relationships as not not necessarily the, the men. Very often today it's yeah. the women. Uh, time has changed. You know, people still project, oh, it's men who want this, not women. It's totally... It's totally not true, at least in my experience, in counseling experience. Uh, I think that there are different steps here. Um, I think, like, of course, like, um, it's important to explore, like, uh, first of all, uh, if the person that does not want the opening, um, uh, why is that? Is there fears? Is there conflicts? Is there a history also of trauma or sexual trauma, relational trauma behind, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then this could be an opportunity for this person to explore all these things and, and heal that doesn't mean that once she or he heals or wants polyamory, uh, uh, but it means that it's an opportunity for growth. So I always, uh, I always like paint this canvas for them. Like this is great; it's an opportunity for growth for both of you, for both of you, if you are willing to. So the key is: are they willing to explore that? Because uh, again, because of the mononormativity and the polyphobia, normally like if people want non-monogamy, is like well, um, it's like greed or sexual greed. Uh, the normal is the other thing, you know. But well, maybe also we can invite people who uh, are resistant to explore that. What's going on there is some deeper, deeper fears and uh, are fears that we can also explore together with your partner to, to, to really make sure that you feel taken care of in this exploration because um, there are many ways to open a relationship. And of course, sometimes um, it's necessary like a period of reflection, um, period of reflection, even sometimes a period of like um, 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 more autonomous separation lives in mm-hmm. which um, if they both agree, in which one person is living one thing, the other person is, is not, uh, is living monogamy and the other person is non-monogamy and then they, they come back together later and they share what has been happening for them. And uh, and of course, very often I would say like, uh, depending on the, the level of um, uh, anxiety or stress around the situation, I think like to contact like a, a professional, yeah. someone who but it needs to be a professional that is does not have any agenda either for pro mono or pro poly. Someone who is really attuned to mm-hmm. to what is true for each person. Uh, in some of the couples I've seen, uh, the outcome has been: listen, um, your partner really does not really want uh, non monogamy, and that's not negotiable. 
Uh, and then for you, you need to decide, um, do you want to still be with your partner and sacrifice this sexual diversity or this desire that you have or not? And then they need to speak. Maybe it could be like separation of some time and then they, they come back together or not. So that's kind of a bit of the process. But it's important to, to frame everything as an opportunity for growth. Mm-hmm. And most people that come to me, they, they, are, they are ready for that. Mm-hmm. And related to this, I have here the question, is society at large ready or prepared to accept an monogamist society? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great question. Uh, I would say one, I would just want to put it in a context that in a way, the non-monogamy, it's, it's running amok already. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the statistics tell us, you know, the amount of uh, people that the, the self-defined as monogamous and monogamous couples, the amount of uh, adultery, of cheating, according to empirical studies, surveys, anonymous surveys, is tremendous. So that's already happening. <laughs> so the, my question is, is society ready to do all that in a more honest and transparent <laughs> way? Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the challenge here is like... Uh, you know, the, most of the people who cheat, you know, I, I also work in my counseling practice with adulterous people who are struggling with what we are doing because they don't feel good about that, sincere people. Of mm-hmm. course, there is like some kind of narcissistic, sociopathic men in particular that, they, you know, they, they don't care, you know. But minimally honest people, you know, they would, uh, would just tell them like, well, what's, what's going on here, no? What, uh, why are you cheating? Why are you cheating? Why are you don't tell your mm-hmm. partner? And invariably they will tell me, well, I don't talk with my partner because if I tell her, two things can happen, will happen for sure. One, something of the magic that we have will get lost of this romantic delusion, Mm -hmm. because it's a delusion because he's Mm -hmm. not being monogamous. But two, and this is the greatest fear, my partner may want to do the same and that's not something I'm ready to assume. So people who cheat, the paradox is that they cheat not because they don't love their partners, it's because they love them. If they don't, if they wouldn't love them, they would leave them, yeah. right? But of course, it's like a very, um, it's a not very smart. Uh, it's, it's like a counter counterproductive mm-hmm. way to go around. It's not a good strategy because most cheaters they feel super bad about themselves. That corrodes the emotional intimacy with their partners. At the end of the day, they get caught uh, or they confess their affairs and the separation. So I normally and also like to don't tell your partner that you are doing that. You're infantilizing your partner. You are not allowing your partner to have like um, all the full information to take her own choices uh, in a full informed manner. And that's very sad. And I always encourage people to move towards transparency, of course, unless there are some cases of like mental illness, for example, that that kind of piece of information could create like a physical danger for the partner, maybe even suicide, mm-hmm. uh, imagine like borderline personalities, mm-hmm. things like that. And then you need to take a much more different strategy and much more cautious and, and be aware of the timing for that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's that's part of why people cheat, you know. <laughs> they, they, they want to do it, but they don't want their partners to do it. So it's a double standard, of course. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's very sad. Mm-hmm. So in terms of, if I now open the space for you to share some words of experience or wisdom with the new generations who who are looking for novel or freer ways to explore themselves in relationship to others, wanting to keep or maintain this integrity, you know, do things right, what would be some of your words to yes. them? Well, it's, uh, I'm not sure if um, the words of wisdom is that <laughs> raising the bar very high. But uh, what I would say based on my personal experience and what I have studied and the, all the people I've have conversations with about this for decades, it's like it's super important that you, you really uh, become clear about what your deepest needs are and your deepest desires are. Uh, to, to stay truth to yourself is very important. And then be transparent, like, but in a, in a candid, humble way, to approach your partner, like, listen, darling, I, I love you so much. I want to be with you. I don't want what I'm going to tell you to break our relationship. And I'm afraid, I'm really afraid that if I say this, this is going to damage something. And at the same time, I'm experimenting all this desire for sexual variety. Maybe there is some 
sexual fantasies that um, I cannot do with you because you don't, you are not into that, you are not interested, or maybe there is a, um, something in my heart that feels like I needs to like explore a different dimension of my heart mm-hmm. for, a, for a more affectionate, romantic connection without sexuality with this particular person. I have this affinity with this friend I've met, and I would love to connect with her. Just to be very humble and like to place from a place of vulnerability and to space from a place of, of truth. Mm-hmm. And then also the other thing is like to, to, I would tell all these younger generations is like, if you move uh, in all those directions, you will feel more empowered about, about who you are in the world. And at the same time, you'll realize you have more compassion to your, you, yourself and others. You will realize that we are all work in progress that we are changing all the time, that we, and the vows that we make like 10 years ago, we are not precognitive or omniscient. We can change and that's okay, you know, to change. It's part of evolution and life and we are part of life. So um, the needs and desires you had like five years ago may not be the same ones that have now or five years from now. So it's embracing that kind of fluidity, mm-hmm. that kind of uh, changing dynamism. You know? I tell you, know, I tell you in the book of Novogamy, like uh, one of my main messages is like, uh, you know, your inner complexity and your inner dynamism of who you are prevents that perhaps that a commitment to a particular relation as a style is going to uh, be a place of growth for you forever or completely and so forth you know you need to open to life and also the the cards that life threw at you mm-hmm. for many people they are like happy in a monogamous relationship for even eight ten years and then maybe sexuality is not what it is to be and that's one of the most common you know mm-hmm. uh, motivations for couples to come to a couple counseling about their sexuality and then maybe they meet someone that awakens those feelings well, life brought that into your life. What you yes. do with that is your decision and that needs to be like an ecological decision, not just, oh, I want to do this, I'll do it. But if you are in committed relationships, it needs to be part of a larger conversation with your partner and perhaps even from your community of friends. Mm-hmm. It's important because these conversations, they get stuck in their diet and, uh, and then they get into circles and spirals that they are not very constructive that's why it's helpful to see a couple counselor, but also it's very helpful, if perhaps even more, to, to share the conversation with friends. And of course, you need to be careful with who do you share it with, because otherwise you can get a lot of negative projection, yeah. starting more conservative people. So you need to be cautious about that too. Beautiful. And our last question is, how do you, Jorge, remind yourself to not sleepwalk your way through life? <laughs> <laughs> that's an interesting question like because uh, it's, uh, it's 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 about reminding myself you no know, it's um uh, i would say it's like um definitely like um i don't know i stayed uh, many years in doing buddhist practice mindfulness mm-hmm. practices like 12 15 years and there is something of the values of buddhist like a uh, mindfulness like the the sense of inquiry that even though I stop practicing Buddhist per se, mm-hmm. they stay with me, you know. So life is a mindful adventure. Mind feels an inquiry. So for me to approach life as something like uh, really mysterious and while just inquiring together as human beings, giving baby steps to really understand what this life in this planet floating in the cosmos is about. One of my hunches is that there is something about this miracle that we call Gaia, uh, that uh, it's one of the few places in the cosmos, perhaps, that in which we can really integrate consciousness and matter, yeah. and also consciousness and uh, that kind of uh, primordial energy of life connected to our sexuality, that uh, I say is also spiritual energy in a more kind of uh, undifferentiated way, but where all the generative power of spirit or the mystery or, or whatever you want to call it is there, no? So for me, it's more like an approach to life, no? no? More than, uh, yeah, sometimes I woke up and I do some meditation in the mornings. Uh, I'm not I'm not doing I'm not doing so well these days, but uh, I always want to do it regularly. You know, of course, nature any contact with nature it's always awakening. Every time you know, nobody, nobody goes to nature and regrets. Why? Because nature make us more happy, connected to that larger network of life, mm-hmm. and that's an awakening experience itself. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I have really answered your question. I you want, have. Do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jorge. It was a pleasure to have you here. 
Wonderful, Carlota. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, this conversation. It has been like, a total pleasure and uh, I really hope that it serves many other people, just especially just to open the conversations. That's what we need at this stage of our evolution. Like, we need just to talk, to, to express our deepest desires and needs, you know, with, with vulnerability and with truthfulness, you know. I think that's, that's the path forward and we don't know where it's leading. We don't know where it's leading and that's very exciting. So um, we're co-creating it as we go. Exactly. <laughs>